Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where in the world you're joining us from today. Um, my name is Dave Haar. I'm the Vice President of Digital Signage Solutions for Kramer Electronics. I'd like to welcome you all today to our, um, our session on Digital Signage 101, The Basics, and I'd like to thank Commercial Integrator for hosting this webinar series. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, you should have a Q&A uh, box on your screen for, um, for questions that you will have. I will try and answer them as you, as you present them to me, if you have any questions along the way. Um, if I don't get to them um, or if I skip by them, it's because I'm, uh, I'm distracted and I didn't see it. And I'll make sure that we get to all of the questions um, at the end of the session and, um, and, and make sure that we follow up with you on, on, that, uh, on anything that you might have questions about after, afterwards if necessary. Um, as I said, my name is Dave Haar. I'm the Vice President of Digital Signage um, Solutions at Kramer Electronics. We, um, I'd like to try and you know, make this as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to, to jot them down. We're going to cover a plethora of information today um, about, um, about digital signage and, um, and its practice. We have a, a, an interesting eclectic group of people that are on the line, um, some systems integrators, some vendor partners, as well as a number of end users. So I will try and make the, um, the information that I disseminate uh, relevant to all of you, and hopefully at the end you'll have a better picture of the elements that go into a digital signage deployment, exactly what digital signage can be used for, and how you may either benefit as, a, as part of your business or benefit as part of, um, as part of the um, as part of your practice in terms of communication. So as we get started, um, you've seen digital signage popping up everywhere um, in places you can imagine and probably some places you haven't imagined. Um, many of your customers or you yourself have already started to look at ways to employ dynamic digital signs in your business. Um, as we'll discuss today, your, one of your jobs is to determine how you might be able to convert a portion of your static sign business with your customers into a recurring revenue generating dynamic digital signage practice, or if you're that potential user of dynamic digital signage, your job is to look at where dynamic digital signage can help you communicate better um, than the static signs you might be using to your employees, your customers, your patients, um, your patrons. If you're already a user of digital signs or are contemplating using them, as many of you are, we'll be looking at all of the different elements that go into a successful deployment and provide tips on the best practices in this industry. Before we get started, I really want to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to um, the definition of digital signage. Um, in this way, we can all start on a level playing field when we're discussing um, what it might mean for you or for your business. So Kramer's definition of digital signage is, a, is that it is a network of one or more digital screens or display devices that are used to deliver the right information to the right audience in the right place at the right time. Um, digital signage combines various media types on an output display device, each in their own region, to create a message. As we will show in the coming slides, digital signage is for organizations of all sizes and all markets, suitable to one um, or for one to multiple thousands of displays. It is the result of content creation, deployment, and distribution, and it can be on a local, municipal, national, or global scale. A dynamic sign has considerably more stopping power than a static sign that you might, you or your customers might be using today. They also can be updated much more frequently and at considerably less cost than printing, distributing, and hanging static signs. There are many ways and places where dynamic digital signage can replace static signs in the marketplace in you or your customers' locations. Many of the digital signs that we see today um, our static signs were static signs just a few years ago. And like static signs can take many forms, including freestanding free towers, 
flat screens hung from walls and ceilings, electronic displays integrated into end caps at retail stores, video walls in all sorts of venues, and even those 30-foot or larger outdoor billboards. Um, but this webinar today will hopefully allow you to see if you're a business where you can profit from asking the right questions with the right partners behind you to begin or extend your efforts you've already taken to create a dynamic digital signage practice, or if you're the end user, to implement a dynamic digital signage messaging system to replace the real estate of your current static signs. As many of you know, messages provide for different results, depending upon the environment in which your sign is being placed. Once you understand the importance of content and creating positive results in your audience locations, you'll have 90% of the battle won. Your only challenge is to help yourself or your customers turn your static signage real estate into a digital sign and to use the screen as the message delivery method rather than what they may or what you are using today. What kinds of customers are using digital signs? They are places that your there are places at your, yours or your customer's locations where using a digital sign might be more profitable and potentially less costly than the current static signs you, you or your customers may be using. Um, Again, by the end of the webinar today, you'll hopefully have enough tools in your toolbox to understand the business for your customers, or if you are a customer, um, to really understand how you can use a dynamic digital sign messaging within your organization. And pretty much across the gamut, if we look at um, our experience, and our experience comes from both the Minicom digital signage side of our business as well as Kramer Electronics, and if we look at our business, we have um, a little over 400,000 screens deployed around the world and pretty much um, cover all of these industries that we have listed here today. Um, in our experience, we found that there are three basic types of digital signage networks. So if you're a systems integrator out there and you're looking at, well, what type of network um, is my customer going to be interested in? or if you're the end user, it's like what kind of customer or what kind of network do I want to put out into the marketplace. Um, we found in our experience that there's really three basic types of network and content management software that goes along with this type of um, or with these types of deployments. Um, the first one is out of home advertising. Um, these are networks that are really designed for sales and brand lifting. Um, they include advertising messages, promotions, new products. Um, branding of a location, branding of a facility, branding of a, a product or a service. Um, the second type of network that we've seen in the marketplaces are what we call point of information. Um, these networks are designed to educate and inform. Um, they can be everything from flight schedules or bus schedules or menu boards or news and weather information or event information or location or wayfinding information. Um, those types of messages that are providing information, um, there may be some element of branding associated with points of information networks, and in some cases, some blending even of some advertising in there. But fundamentally, um, the idea of the network is to provide information for that audience. And again, depending upon the venue, um, that, that information is going to be different. Um, the last type of application is what we call office or corporate applications. Um, in this particular case, the, the network is really designed to educate the motivate and to, to inform um, employees or visitors to a particular organization. Um, these types of messages can include everything from employee bulletins to welcome messages to training material on products or services. They might have some meeting room schedules. Um, they might have some call center data or, or manufacturing data or statistical data. So these are the three basic types of networks that we see out in the marketplace um, from our experience. Um, how do they, or why do we use them? Um, basically, we're using digital signage because um, they're location specific. I can place the appropriate content exactly where I want the messages to be. Um, if I'm looking, like for instance, inside of a retail store, I could put different information at the deli counter, at the pharmacy, at end caps, at the front desk. Um, if I'm in a, you know, again, depending upon the industry that we're talking about, um, the appropriate content can be placed really where you want the messages to be received. 
Um, they are day specific. I can change them during the day. So if I'm in a doctor's office, for instance, I might have um, more um, adult-centered information in the morning and maybe child-centered information after school is out or things like that. So I can really change the content during the day, during the week, during the week time of year. Um, I can actually, um, if I can, besides being able to be day specific, I can actually be event specific. There are lots of different content management software packages out there on the marketplace today that have something that we call triggers, which allow an event, whether it's a, a depletion of inventory or a weather event or an emergency or whatever, to actually trigger the content. Um, Again, digital signs as opposed to static signs can be updated remotely. I don't need to ship new materials, wait for them to be printed, wait for them to be shipped, wait for them to be displayed. I can change that content on the fly, as I said, um, based upon different triggers or based just upon the results that I'm looking to get. Um, and I also can receive feedback from, um, from the signs themselves in terms of the content was in fact being played when I expected it to be played. Um, and my content is typically um, dynamic. If we look at the components of a digital signage network, there are really seven elements. Um, I'm showing, I think, five of them here. Um, but the first four elements really revolve around the content, um, the, the business aspect of, again, going back to those three different types of networks, what is the business behind developing a digital signage network? Um, when you look at um, when you look at that, at that strategy, it's like, what, what, what am I looking to accomplish? And it really goes all the way to the end of measuring how am I being successful, goes back to making sure that before you even get started, you've got really good objectives in mind. You know what your ROI or your ROO is going to be. You'll recognize what partners I need to be working with. Um, and, then get, and then that will drive you into, if you will, the content design, the content creation. Um, you'll look at, you know, how do I want to lay out my screens? You'll look at, uh, maybe you'll start looking at content management software in terms of which content management software package is the package that I want to use because it meets the needs that I have for, um, for my business. We then get into um, the hardware aspect of a digital signage network, and, and that really is looking at what type of display device do I want to use, what type of player do I want to use, um, how am I going to get the content then distributed from the players out to, um, to the screens, how am I going to mount the screens, am I going to put them on a wall, is it going to be a video wall, is it, uh, is it going to be freestanding, do I want to have one screen showing content, or do I want to have ten screens showing the same content, all of those decisions that go into um, building um, the key elements of a digital signage network. And there's some, there's some really good information available in the marketplace and some organizations that have really studied this and, and worked with network um, integrators and VARs and network owner and operators and really put together some best practices. Um, I do have a slide at the end of the presentation that goes into some of these resources if you're not um, familiar with them at the moment. Um, so those are the basic elements of um, what goes into developing the network. Um, as I said, content is really the, the king. Um, the, the content is what's going to drive your success. Whatever your message, creating the content and keeping it fresh is really going to be um, or consume the greatest amount of budget and time. Um, it, you really need to consider when you're develop, developing your network, you know, the time it's going to take to create the content and keeping it fresh, um, the cost it's going to, to, to take to keep it, uh, to create it and keep it fresh, the resources that you may need either internal or external to your organization for managing that content, um, what are you looking at, you know, again, how do you know when it's working and, and um, what do you look the con for the content to accomplish? within the environment that you happen to be working or your, or your customers happen, happen to be working. Um, can I use my internal marketing department? Can I repurpose some of the material that I've created maybe for my website or my print advertising and can I rework that into um, the digital signage uh, content uh, strategy? 
And again, it really is the thing that, that before you get started, somebody, somebody asked a question already, what is the biggest stumbling block you have to overcome? And depending upon whether or not you're a systems integrator or you're the customer themselves out here, you really have, it's almost the same stumbling block. And the stumbling block is you all need to make sure that you understand what it is that you want that sign to do or what it is that your customer wants that sign to do. Um, and then you really need to figure out, again, um, the strategy for keeping that content fresh because it's a whole lot more involved than, okay, I'm going to put a screen up on the wall and show a PowerPoint. Um, you know, that might last for the first 10 minutes. But you really want to make sure that you understand the purpose of the screen or the purpose of the display device that you're putting in place is, and that if you're the end user, you understand that creating the content and getting it to that screen is going to require resources, both time and, in some cases, money, to do that. And then if you're the systems integrator, you really want to make sure that your customer understands their content strategy and that you have partners in place that can help them from the either content creation side or the content management side to help them refresh that content and make that an easy process for them to do. So these are just, this is by no means an exclusive list of content management software companies. But there are, this is an illustrative example of some of them. And each of them provide different elements or different um, features, if you will, that may or may not be um, applicable to your particular situation or your particular application. So as a systems integrator, you know, obviously you need to go out and and do your homework for your customers so that you maybe have a, you know, a simple package, a more advanced package, and a, you know, super duper Cadillac Deluxe package available for your customers to choose from. If you're the end user, you really need to look at the things like the ease of use, the um, how, how, um, how, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? How scalable is the software if I decide to start with one location and I'm expanding to, you know, 100 locations or 500 locations, you really need to make sure that the software that you choose fits your model and your budget. Um, and there are, you know, there are different ways in which um, the content management software comes to market. In some cases, you're buying the software, you're getting a player with that software, and you're off and running, and you own it. In other cases, there's something called software as a service model where the actual content um, is being hosted by the content management software company. And, and as you, as you um, license players, you would be able to disseminate the content from the host you know, through the internet or through the cloud um, down to the specific players to get the content that you want to have played. So, um, suffice it to say, it's, it is probably the most challenging aspect of moving forward with either implementing digital signage or maintaining digital signage to make sure that the content management software, in fact, meets all of your needs. Um, the next step is really content players, and this is, um, this is to a great extent determined by the content management software you choose. Um, and what I mean by that is most of the content management software packages come embedded on proprietary players. Other software, you're buying the software package, but the content management software company is providing you with all of the specifications that you need um, to, to, to pick the right PC or the right uh, appliance to optimize the performance of that content management software. So um, players, these are just, a, again, a few of the manufacturers that are out there. Many of them, DT Research, AOP, and IIDEA, all do OEM work. And actually, I think Dell does as well. OEM work for the content management software. So you may not recognize this as an AOPEN player if you're using you know, Scala or, or ComKey or whoever. Um, but, in fact, that's, that's who the manufacturer is behind the players. Um, so this is, you know, like I said, this is mostly driven by, um, by the, uh, the content management software packages. Um, distribution services. Now, this is, this is interesting um, because it really is going to depend upon your environment 
to determine the best way to get the information or your content to your players. So if you're a single store location, if you're a single office location, obviously your, um, your channel for getting the content to the screen is going to be much less complex than if you're, oh, I don't know, Walmart, or if you're a Burger King, or if you're a huge um, conglomerate out there that's got, you know, global locations, you know, around the world and you want to be able to get information or the same information to all of your offices, et cetera, et cetera. So you really need to look at, um, you know, your, is it going to be through my cable provider? Is it going to be through my, um, is it going to be through my, um, my wireless phone provider? Is it going to be through, you know, uh, a company like Hughes or Coxcom or Blackbox? Um, that will that will disseminate the information across a WAN or across a LAN. Um, in some cases, you might be using USB sticks because it's real simple and that's where you want how you want to do it. Um, obviously, uh, more and more people are using the the internet and the networking um, capabilities in today's world to get content distributed. Um, once you get it to the location then you need to distribute it to the screens. And we'll talk a little bit later on about where Kramer fits in um, and the differences or the choices that you have within your venue in terms of where am I going to place my player versus where am I going to place my screens? Um, are they going to be together? Are they going to be apart? And, and some of the best practices that we've um, that we found in our experience for getting the information from, um, from the players to the screens within the venue. Um, display solutions. These are the most visible aspect of the network, um, probably second in importance to the content and its management. There are tons of questions you need to ask yourself when choosing your display provider. Um, there are a number of choices you have, each with their own benefits and considerations, whether it's LCD or LED or plasma or a projector um, or how the size of it. Um, there's also a whole set of rules to determine the size of the screen that you need, the type of the screen you need, and where to place your screen in relationship to your audience. And all of the display manufacturers have got, you know, have got these rules pretty much down pat. And, and if you're the systems integrator, you, I'm sure you, you're very familiar with you know, some of the rules that they have in place. If you're an end user, your systems integrator should very well you know, should be uh, able to uh, work you through a set of questions which will determine you know, the best types of screens. Um, but if I was going to focus on the most important element in choosing a display device when looking at best practices, it would be to make sure that you choose a solution that is a commercial grade rather than a consumer grade. Um, and this is really, really important because commercial grade screens, number one, can be oriented in a portrait or landscape mode, giving you significantly more flexibility in the placement of the screens and the content or the creativity that you can use with your content. Um, commercial grade screens are designed to be operated minimally 16 hours a day. Um, most of them now are 24, uh, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. While consumer grade screens are designed to be operated on an average of eight hours or less a day. Um, commercial grade screens typically come with a three-year on-site warranty. Consumer grade screens come with a one-year carry-in, and in many cases are voided. Um, when used in a commercial environment. So you really need to be, if you're the systems integrator, you really need to be cognizant of that. If you're the end user, you need to really pay attention to that. You don't want to go cheap. And even though a commercial screen is going to cost several hundred dollars more than a consumer screen is going to cost you, over the life of that screen, you know, you're not going to have to replace it three times because it's going to last you know, three to five to more years. Um, whereas the consumer screens, um, unfortunately, we live in a very consumable society, and so um, our technology tends to um, tends to have that um, obsolescence, if you will, built into it, as well as as well as um, you know, not designed to be overused in, in a particular environment. Um, and then the, the last element of commercial versus consumer is the commercial grade screens typically all come with the ability of control either through RS-232 or IP. And what this does is this really enables the content management software to turn them on, turn them off, uh, change the input, uh, adjust the volumes, um, really allow anything that the, the, content, the uh, screen manufacturer allows you to do 
but being able to do it over the same um, cable connections or over the same connections that you have for um, your content management software. It also gives you the ability to report back if you're in an ad-based environment, gets the, gives you the ability to communicate with your screen to in fact ensure that it was on and set to the proper input channel when in fact my ad was playing. So you can make sure in that ad-based network that you're getting paid for um, the content that you have in fact have been showing. Um, the last thing that I want to emphasize is the fact that um, screen placement is really um, an essential element to the success of the messages getting to your audience. Um, and placement of that screen really leads to the next piece of our puzzle, um, which are mounting solutions. And mounting solutions are not something to be taken lightly. Um, many times um, I, I talk to my colleagues in this, in this space, and, and they bemoan the fact that, that somebody really didn't think about um, whether or not the wall that they wanted to put their video wall on will in fact hold the screens. And so there's lots of considerations when you're designing the, um, the actual screen placement um, that you need to take into account. And, and, and the cost of mounting obviously is, is one of them. The, will the, will the, the place that I'm, I'm putting them um, hold the weight? Um, is there power available? Am I going to need to run power? Um, are they visible to the audience and can the audience read them? Uh, where you put your screen makes a big difference in how they'll be effective or non-disruptive to the core business. And obviously there's going to be a cost associated with that decision. So it is one of the elements, while it's, it's sometimes overlooked, it really is very, very important when looking at the overall um, cost of installation and cost of maintenance on your network. Um, do you know what you want? Um, do you need help getting, you know, are you looking for someone who can assist you in all aspects of your network procurement? Are you an integrator or a VAR? Are you looking for a reputable place to purchase? Um, digital signage solutions are popping up in a number of different industries. They're popping up in the static sign industry. They're not popping up in the pro A, B industry. They're popping up in the IT dealers. Um, and there's really too many to mention on, um, on this PowerPoint slide. Um, I have these four particular distributors up here just as an example because they are the four distributors that Minicom Digital Signage, before it was acquired by Kramer, um, worked with in, in terms of providing our solutions to the marketplace. But it is by no means, by absolutely no means, a, um, a complete list, if you will, of uh, where, the, where digital signage products and the services associated with digital signage products can be, um, can be acquired from. Um, deployment services. One of, the challenges, um, one of the challenges that folks run into is the fact that they may, they may come across an opportunity for a nationwide or international rollout to their, either their locations or if you're the systems integrator to your customers' locations. And you don't necessarily, or they don't necessarily have the resources to do the deployment on that, on that type of a scale. There are a number of, of companies, and again, this is just an illustrative example. There are more than USSI or legacy or rollouts available um, in the marketplace. There are some associations, people like, um, people like, uh, oh, I'm right out of my head. There's a couple of organizations within the, um, within the AV space, for instance, that pool their resources together in order to help dealers, um, to help dealers in, um, in putting together a deployment that may that may go out of their geographic area. So, this is something that uh, that you need to consider um, whether or not you need to be partnering with somebody or using the resources of your organization or um, the industry in which you you participate to reach out to um, to another company to help you partner or to help you um, deploy the, the the systems out there in, into the world. Um, I've got a question about uh, insight in dealing with historical buildings and spaces. Um, this gets back, we'll go all the way back to when you're designing the space and you're designing, you know, where to place the screens. Um, the insight that I have is, is that you really need to pay attention to what the codes are. You need to pay attention to what the requirements are going to be for the building. Um, we have a number of installations that are in historical buildings where um, places like Grand Central Station, for instance, where it's very, very limited. And you really, in a lot of cases, your, 
Um, you're using, for instance, extension and distribution equipment, so there's less, um, there's less power requirements at the screen, for instance. Um, you need to, you know, pay attention to can I use wireless? Um, it's not necessarily something that we would, would recommend in, in a lot of spaces, but in some places it's, it's going to be essential because I'm not able to drill through buildings or I'm not able to, you know, run cable or conduits or do or rip up floors or do whatever because of the historical significance of buildings. Obviously, it adds another challenge. It adds, um, it adds another element of um, design expertise that you need to have when working with um, customers that have uh, this type of spaces. But it is possible. Um, there are, you know, we've got the Smithsonian, we've got the Museum of Natural History, we've got a lot of places that are replacing the, st the static signs with a digital sign, um, but they're obviously doing it in a um, non-intrusive way um, in, in order to not negatively affect the aesthetics or the historical value um, of the property. But it is, it is possible to do. Um, there are a couple of companies out there that, that specialize in, um, in working with historical buildings, and so we can certainly turn you on to them um, or, or certainly have discussions through, um, through different partners. There are some considerations. Um, when you, when you consider designing a network, when you consider um, switching over from a static sign to a digital sign, um, and obviously the, the, the first one that pops into everybody's head is, um, is cost. You know, is there, there's going to be an investment. And, and so depending upon, again, really depending upon your environment, and you know, the, the wonderful challenge that I always say is that digital signage is so unique because every answer, the, the answer to every question is, you know, is it depends. But cost is going to be a problem, um, or it's going to be a consideration. There are lots of different financing and leasing options and creative financing that folks can use th these days for digital signage networks. Um, the thing that I want to emphasize over on, on the cost side of things is it really is critical that if you're especially dealing with multiple locations that you run a pilot, that you don't, that you don't just wham, bam, let me go out there and put the whole thing in because that's, that's, that's the way I want to do it. It's like run a pilot. Um, and really run the pilot primarily for the content side of things. Um, you know, I, my screen manufacturer friends will hate me for saying this, but a commercial screen is a commercial screen is a commercial screen. Obviously, there are some significant differences between the different manufacturers that are out there, but, you know, the, the, end, use, the end user is going to experience an image on a screen. Um, you need to make sure as the systems integrator or as the network owner operator yourself that you, that the, your money is being spent wisely, and that when I decide to really pull the trigger on spending more money, that I have the concept tested, that it's been proven that the content is doing what I need the content to be doing, and so by rolling it out, I will just get more and better results from that content. Um, the other thing is that digital signage, one of the other considerations is that these networks can, can and sometimes be complex, and, um, and you need to involved in the decision-making process and in the design process, all of the interested parties within your organization, or if you're the assistance integrator, all of the interested parties within the customer's organization so that they understand the purpose of the network and the benefit of the network before you really even get started. Um, and that way, if, if IT needs to be involved, or finance, or marketing, or sales, or human resources, or all of those folks that may in fact benefit from the network are involved in the process, it's going to be much easier for them to pull the trigger and move forward. Um, and then the last thing, obviously, is the return on investment, because it's not always money. Sometimes it's an objective. Sometimes it's a behavioral change. Um, sometimes the, you know, it's just you know, decreasing perceived wait time is, is a classic example of, of what um, the results somebody is looking for a digital signage network. So it really, really is important that the, you define your objectives if you're the end user or you work with your customers to make sure that they understand the objectors, objectives of their network um, and, they're, and they are monitoring the progress frequency, frequently. Um, you know, make sure that, that 
somebody's paying attention to the content, somebody's paying attention to the results. Um, and as a result, the, the, the networks tend to expand, or, or the, you, if you're the end user, you'll see other uses for screens, maybe in other areas of your business, and, and it really becomes a very, very viable um, communication tool for you, to your customers, to your patrons, to your employees. Um, I want to touch a little bit on um, distribution technology because this is where my background falls into, into this space. Um, and I also mentioned earlier that we were going to touch on it. I'm not going into, into very uh, big detail here. I do have a complete webinar on um, the cost ramifications of player placements. Um, but there really are two choices when you're, when you're looking at designing your network. One of the choices is to put your players right at your screens. Um, there are some benefits to that in terms of I can have different content on every screen. I can use existing network infrastructure. I can, te I can potentially use wireless communication to get the content to the screens. Um, and I'm producing a playlist per log per screen so that I'm, I'm able to uh, report back. Um, some of the drawbacks of a player at the screens are the maintenance issues that are involved with um, accessing and servicing that player while it's sitting at the screen. Um, many times the price, the, the price of the, the players are going to be prohibitive because, especially in, in some environments, environments, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, it's going to be less, much less expensive to use distribution and extension equipment than a player at every screen. Um, and also, in the, in the case of the, the players that are built into the screens, um, many times they're going to have some limited application in terms of the types of content that they can play back, the types of files that they can handle, the size of the files that they can handle. Um, and obviously, another may be a drawback, may not be a drawback, but there is going to be a significant amount of IT um, administration involved with uh, a player at screen network. Uh, the other choice that you have is putting the player someplace else, um, locating them in a closet, locating them in a back room, locating them inside instead of outside, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the benefit is I'm going to use that same infrastructure or TAT5 cabling um, to get my signals from the players to the screens. Um, if, I'm in, if I'm in that one-to-many environment, um, like I'm showing there in that upper, the picture on the upper right-hand side there, uh, the content uh, the content is going to get to the screens all at the same time, so I don't need to deal with timing issues. I don't need to deal with network bandwidth issues. Um, the, could servers, the, the servers are all consolidated in one room. That room could be secure. Um, I don't need to deal with my network because I'm completely out of band. Um, one of the drawbacks is the fact that you know, I am using dedicated cabling, um, and I'm not necessarily using that network infrastructure um, you know, as part of the network, but um, it is something that is, uh, and we'll show you in, in the next slide, something that is that you need to consider. Um, in our experience, as I mentioned before, we've got over 400,000 screens out there. There are really just three times when extension and distribution solutions should be used or should be considered. Um, and this is by no means a hard and fast rule. Um, it, it, extension and distribution probably represents between um, 25 and 40 percent of the of the pie, if you will, in terms of um, the application in digital signage. Um, the other um, 75 to or 60 to 75 percent is putting the player at the screen. But you should consider using extension distribution when you're simultaneously showing the same content on multiple screens. The reason is that. In 99% of the cases, the content management software companies are charging you by the player license. If you are using or sending the same content to multiple screens within a venue, it will always be less expensive to use extension and distribution systems because, number one, the receivers tend to be less expensive than um, the players, and number two, there is no recurring fee on every player for that content stream. Um, you're paying for the one player, and it can go to you know five screens or ten screens or two hundred screens, depending upon you know the environment that you're in. But it's going to be um, it's going to be uh, less expensive to use um, distribution and extension rather than the player at every screen. Uh, the second scenario is whenever I'm putting screens in places where it is either difficult to reach during business hours or reaching them during business hours is going to, going to disrupt my business. 
So examples of this might be a shopping mall where I can't bring in a forklift and the screen is, you know, 10 feet off the floor. I can't bring in the forklift during the day. I need to wait till after the mall is closed. And I'm, you know, obviously paying for security and paying for um, additional costs associated with, with servicing the players. Um, and regardless of the fact that players are, in fact, becoming more and more robust, as the digital signage industry matures, they are still the piece of the puzzle that require the most maintenance, they require the most hand-holding and touching and updating and doing things to um, more than any other piece of the digital signage puzzle. So servicing them becomes a huge issue or major issue and you really want to avoid maintenance costs or additional maintenance costs when, you, when, um, when you're placing, you know, when you're considering the placement of those players. Another example would be like a quick service restaurant where I can't have the player behind the screen because I can't get to it during lunchtime. And if it's down during lunchtime, I'm missing the opportunity or I, or I need to make sure that I built in redundancy so that I have an opportunity to keep that screen alive. Otherwise, I've got a dead screen during business hours and it really is going to affect the business or the cost more, um, again, to access it. And then the last scenario is when I'm putting screens in places where they, it is a harsh environment for the player. Um, that menu board with the fryer grease and the dust and dirt that comes up from the, from the fryers is an example. Another example might be a manufacturing plant or an outdoor menu board in a, in a fast food restaurant. Again, I don't want to have the players outside. I want the players in a, inside in a safe and secure location. Um, just very quickly, this is a list of some of the solutions that are available from Kramer. We have both analog and digital distribution systems as well as our own media player. Um, I'm not going into any of this today. In fact, if you're interested, I do have a webinar coming up next Monday on going into all of these solutions. But otherwise, you know, call up your Kramer person or get in touch with Commercial Integrator and they can get, in touch, get you in touch with Kramer. Um, and we can set you up on, on a webinar going into our solutions. This is not the place. Um, this is just another slide about who we are. Um, we've got 30 years experience in this industry. We've got over, as I've mentioned before, 400,000 screens deployed. Um, many of our solutions are award-winning by various digital signage industry um, organizations. Um, the, the Kramer itself is located in 23 countries. We've got a very partner um, and customer-friendly atmosphere. Um, we really look towards a high-value price-performance ratio um, when, when looking at digital signage and when looking at deploying digital signage solutions. Um, and obviously all of our technology is, uh, or not all of it, but a good deal of it is based upon using inexpensive um, Cat5 or Cat6 technology. Uh, digital signage works. Um, I want to get to a couple of the questions. Um, it seems like a, one of the questions was, it seems like a complete solution of uh, a complete system, but what would be the range in terms of quantity of displays when the solution could have better results? Um, I, Sergio, I, I don't remember exactly where you asked that question, um, but if we're talking about one to many, which is I think where the question popped up, um, really after you get past two screens with the same content, it's going to be less expensive to use the distribution solution. It really is past one. Um, and, it, and it is simply because the, the player licensing fees or the recurring annual fees or the recurring monthly fees that are being charged by the content management software companies or being charged by the integrators who are managing that content is going to be more expensive than putting in distribution and extension. Um, one of the other questions we have is what types, what display with integrators would you suggest using? Um, there are a number of different manufacturers that have um, players and integrate them into the screens in different ways. Um, the answer to that question, Terence, really depends upon the application and the content that you're looking to play. So for instance, um, Samsung is one of those that has actually built a player on a chip. Um, and that's fine if it's a relatively simple application, the software, the content management software, the Magic Info software that they ship with it is a very simple, um, not a lot of zones, not a lot of capability, not a lot of storage available, um, but works in, you know, works in, 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 it's pretty robust and it does work in a number of different in, environments. Other manufacturers are taking advantage of things like the ops slot, which is a, um, and I never remember what ops stands for, but it is a, a, a screen interface that was developed by Intel 
that allows for a device to be slid into a slot onto the display, and those devices can be anything from, for instance, we have an HD base T receiver that would go into that slot. So I can use that with my HD base T extension systems, and my only connection at the screen is a Cat5 cable. Or there are players that are using those slots. And so a lot of it depends upon, like I said, the, the content that you're playing and whether or not the player that, that is integrated is going to be able to handle the content that the customer or you are looking to use. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky question, but there are, you know, there's some pluses and some minuses. Um, again, I would only use integrated players when I'm in a one in one screen environment and I'm not planning on send it, sending or showing the same content on more than one screen. Um, I definitely at that point in time, again, move into a distribution environment um, and use um, signal extension and distribution to get the signal uh, to other screens. I mentioned very early on that there are some other um, sources of information. Uh, this is just a, um, a partial list, again, of organizations that support digital signage from the Digital Signage Federation, the Digital Signage Signage Screen Media Association. Um, Digital Signage Expo is a show that Kramer will be um, exhibiting at coming up in February in um, in Las Vegas. Uh, Infocom, which is another uh, trade show in the pro AD space that I know is supported by Commercial Integrator and others, um, is, is in June, and we again will be at that, and there's a pretty good digital signage presence at Infocom. Um, NRF, the National Retail F Federation or Foundation, um, is an organization that, that works with the, uh, the retailers of the world that has its own trade show that, again, has digital signage associated with it. So um, lots of different sources of information that are out there in the world. Um, I think this is the last slide. Oh, nope. I want to acknowledge some people. Um, digital signage, there's a, there's a book out there that's called It Takes a Village. And really, with the digital signage marketplace, we really, found, we really want to point out that it takes a partner. Um, there are very, very few. Uh, there are some, but there are there there are the, the the organizations that are doing soup to nuts and digital signage um, always have partners that they're working with with some element of um, of the network, whether it's on the content creation side or uh, the the management side or the servicing side. There's there's always going to be partners. Um, I want to thank the, the following people: uh, Dale Smith, who was a former director of business development for Peerless. Uh, Bill Gerber, who is the CEO of Wirespring, uh, Laura Davis Taylor, Kurt, Carrie Dawson, and Bert Cotter, who were formerly from Popeye and all have moved on into um, other places within the digital signage space um, for their help, uh, for their contributions to this particular uh, presentation. I should also throw in the Digital Signage Experts Group um, and, uh, and, and their uh, expertise, Jonathan and his, and his father, uh, Jonathan Braun and his dad. Um, have provided some of the, the input and some of the content to, uh, to today's presentation. Um, all of the logos are industry marks of the property of their respective owners. And I, again, I, it takes a, the book, it takes a village, um, in digital signage, it takes partnerships. I want to thank you all for your time today. Um, if anybody's interested in getting in touch with me directly, here is my contact information, my phone number, and my email. Um, address. I want to again thank uh, Commercial Integrator for hosting this partner webinar series. Hopefully you found it um, to be worthwhile and informative. And if you have any other, um, here's another question. Are there resources available for someone brand new to digital signage to help direct them to find the right manufacturers or components? Um, the, the answer is yeah, and we showed it in a couple of slides ago. Uh, one of the good places to start would be with the Digital Signage Federation or the Digital Signage Screen Media Organization. If you are a systems integrator, Digital Signage Expo is the place to go because it is really the only um, trade show that is 100% dedicated to the digital signage marketplace. And you'll see content management software companies there, display manufacturers, um, component manufacturers, content creation companies, um, really all of the puzzle pieces, the, the mounting companies are all um, displaying at Digital Signage Expo, which is coming up in February. Um, but those are, again, just some of the resources that are available. Um, the one thing that I, would, that I would caution you on, or the one thing that I would suggest, if you are a systems integrator and you're looking at going into um, 
the digital signage marketplace is to is to number one pick your partners carefully and don't go hog wild. Um, you really you know if you if you want to work with like I like I mentioned earlier a good better best strategy for content management software then then pick a good better best and there's you know there's 2,500 content management software companies and I'm and I don't think I'm exaggerating. Um, Probably 250 of them are the leaders. The 80-20 rule exists in digital science like it exists everywhere else. And and within that group, there's a good, there's a better, or there's a, I should say, there's a simple, there's a more complex, and there's a, you know, Cadillac, if you will, um, in 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 that particular category. The same thing with the screen manufacturers. It's like they all have offerings for digital signage. Some of them do it them better than others. Um, but again, make sure that you're um, that you're dealing with commercial screens rather than consumer screens because it will um, it will come back to bite you if you go the consumer route. Um, so those are just a couple of the words of advice. Again, we've been I've been doing this for 15 years now, and um, and I'm more than happy to to work with you or your organization in um, putting you in touch with the right people. Um, and uh, I'm not sure about the slides. That's a question for uh, for commercial integrator. And Ariel, can you just chat me that answer? Um, I'm, I'm thinking that this is being recorded, so my guess would my guess would be yes. This is available for later reference, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, it is available on commercialintegrator.com. So, like I said, the, uh, this presentation is available. It, it, you just go to the commercialintegrated.com website, and you can, um, I think, participate in it again, and um, issues, you know, and and whatever. I have another question that actually came up here in the chat box. Uh, hold on a minute. Mentioned commercial versus consumer. We've used commercial and had issues with eDA. I did when using different computers. Um, we ended up using da 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 da. Um, EDID is actually something um, that Kramer has its own training system or training sessions on. Um, it does provide you with some challenges in the digital signage space. Um, but all of our equipment, you know, will manage EDID. Um, it is it is something that uh, the commercial screens typically. Um, what difficulties with commercial screens did the consumers do not? The answer is there's no there's no additional difficulty at all. Um, commercial screens actually will have more um, more features built into them that will help you manage them from a from a networking perspective, um, and will will help you. Um, you know they 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 have more flexibility, if you will, in terms of matching up the content. Um, or the, the format of the content with um, the, the, the particular content management software players that you might be using. So um, it's, it's again, I, I stress over and over again, um, a consumer screen is not the way to go in digital science. You really want to deal with or you really want to work with um, the commercial manufacturers and, um, and their solutions because they are designed for the robustness and the um, the environment, the, the the all of the different elements that go into placing digital signs are are really being worked on very heavily by the the screen manufacturers, and they put a lot of time and effort into um, into those designs. So, again, I um, if you have questions on EDID, again, I'm not necessarily the technical person to talk to about it, but I know that um, at Kramer we've got our own uh, our own uh, certified digitalist training. That we do around the country that provides for um, the type of training, talking about all of the different digital signals, whether it's HDMI or DVI or DisplayPort, um, or um, the analog signals that exist out in the world, and, and how to handle issues um, when you're using different computers in a particular network. Um, but there are ways to get around it. There are ways to um, make sure that, in fact, you're you're uh, maintaining the communication with your screens. Not a difficult. Uh, Um, what other question? Would I suggest in all an all-in-one solution with a company that offers hardware and software, or mix and match product offerings within different companies? Um, and I'm not sure if you're an end user or a systems integrator, but um, 
The answer to that question is that there are a number of systems integrators out there that um, that do the entire, you know, that, that have put together or done the homework for you in terms of the, uh, the different hardware and software packages. If you're an integrator, which you just indicated that you are, um, I would not stick with one company necessarily that's going to offer all of the hardware and the software. They, um, there are a few, um, actually, there, there really isn't one solution because um, while you, while you, if you look at Samsung, for instance, as a screen manufacturer that has their software built in or NEC that has their software built in, um, those solutions are going to be somewhat limited. And, and while they may, they may meet the requirements of a certain percentage of your customers, um, they're, they're not going to be a be-all, end-all. And so you're going to have to have a few different choices within your toolbox when you're going out. Um, and the other reason is that, that unlike, you know, most pro AV or IT installations, if I'm dealing with a data center or if I'm dealing with a conference room, I've got pretty much a, a, a pretty standard set of, of products that I'm going to suggest for that solution. In digital signage, they, because every installation is different and everybody's content requirements are going to be different, um, it, it really requires a little bit more um, flexibility on your part in terms of knowing what's available and knowing what's going to meet your customers' needs. I always used to tell a story. I've been in the computer business. I hate to date myself, but I've been in the computer business since 1981. And, you know, when Apple IIs and 8-inch and floppy disks and all of that stuff was around, probably before many of you were born. But the fact of the matter is that we used to say in the 80s that everything that you have today is obsolete that you're buying today is obsolete. And in the computer business back in the 80s, they had, a, you know, Apple and IBM and Dell and DEC and, and all of the players back then, Atari, all had a different computer every 18 months. And so, you know, customers would come into your store and they'd look at a product and they'd say, I can't buy this, but, you know, it's, 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 I'm waiting for the next thing. And in, in that case, you're never going to buy anything. In digital signage, it's sort of the same thing where, you know, there's so many different changes coming from the technology perspective, from the content management software perspective, that a lot of the things that are available today are changing. And so as a systems integrator, you know, you need to look at the history of, your co of the companies and the partners that you choose. There are some companies that have been in this space for, you know, the 15 years that the space has existed, and it's important that, that and they understand the, all of the different puzzle pieces. You know, it really is, um, it really is, uh, when I go back, when I go all the way back here, I don't know if I can do this by memory, but if I go all the way back to the beginning and we talk about, hold on, I missed it. <clears throat> we talk about these components of a digital signage network. You know, there are some, there are manufacturers on the mounting side, on the, on the screen side, on the distribution side, on the content management software side that have been doing this for a long time. And their solutions are solid. Their solutions continue to be um, accepted in the marketplace. They obviously evolve. Most of the content management software companies have a upgrade path or a, you know, a service path, if you will, for um, maintaining the content or maintaining the software over time. Um, all of the hardware manufacturers are, are presenting at least a three-year, if not longer. Kramer has a seven-year warranty on their product, so it's going to last you through the time. But again, having looking at one solution that offers both hardware and software is really going to be um, problematic in terms of in terms of your success. Um, can you start there? Sure, but I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily stay there. Wow, this hour went fast. Anybody have any other questions? All right, great. I want to thank you. Uh, the answer to that question, do distribution systems have the capability to add ad hoc users or add messages to specific screens? Really is not a function of the distribution system. That's really a function of the content management software. Many of them have the ability for local input. Many of them have the ability to um, to, um, many of them have the ability to have, uh, you know, emergency overrides, for instance, uh, based upon triggers, whether it's a weather event or, a, you know, a, God forbid, you know, human 
event. Um, so all of that, that really is a functionality of the software. It's not necessarily the distribution system. It's just going to take whatever's coming out of the player and distribute it. So, um, <clears throat> and I can do within within different distribution systems messages to different screens or specific screens. Again, that's a function of the software um, and the and the channel of of communication. Whether I'm doing IP streaming or um, or matrix switch or something else. Um, signing up for the other webinars, uh, the easiest thing is, is to email me, um, Anthony, um, or, and, and I can send you a link to that uh, webinar. We did send out a announcement um, the other day, and I think we have another one coming out um, either later today or tomorrow, um, but I will make sure uh, as a follow-up to today's meeting that I send you the link for the webinar on Monday at 11. All right, any, any other questions? All right, I think we're good. Again, I want to thank everybody for their time and attention this afternoon. Um, if you've, you know, we will be following up with you if you've got other questions that we didn't answer. And, um, and, and I guess we're done. So I'm not quite sure how to end this. We didn't talk about that, Ariel. So, um, Uh, another question is, do I know a forum to find potential investors? Um, actually, yeah. The, uh, go to the Digital Signage Federation website. Uh, there's also um, an organization called DOOH, Digital Out of Home. I guess it's just Digital Out of Home. Um, they, have got, uh, they have got a network of investors that, that are doing, um, that are working in the digital signage industry. So that's... Uh, that's it. Uh, that's the place to go. So, if any, nobody has anything else, I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you again very much, and thanks uh, to Commercial Integrator for hosting this uh, series. And hopefully, you found it informative. Have a great rest of your day. Have a great holiday season. Uh, safe, healthy, happy, whatever, um, and a and a, and a good New Year. And again, some of you already done your New Year, so um, celebrate a good New Year with the rest of us. So. Everybody have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye now.